okay, folks, um, just before we start today, I'd remind you that we have midterm on Friday. Every seat will be taken, so get here early if you want a comfortable place. Uh, and remember to bring a standard five-answer uh, Scantron and a pencil. Okay? And then you won't need a calculator or any other apparatus uh, for the exam. And it will be very similar in format to the one that Nick uh, discussed in uh, session this week. Um, what we've seen so far in the pre-industrial world is this world of incredible stasis through all of human history up until 1800 in terms of living conditions, life expectancy. Uh, it, it really is world caught in this uh, Malthusian trap. And that's going to lead us to the next question, which is, well, how did the world escape this trap in the last 200 years? What mechanisms could have been operating to eventually lead to a completely different outcome for societies? And one of the interesting things we're going to see, we're going to see is that there is actually a source of dynamism within the Malthusian economy. And within this simple model, there's actually inherent mechanisms by which the world must have been changing, at least culturally and maybe also genetically, in the period leading up to the Industrial Revolution. And this is interesting because, remember, Malthus, the first edition of The Principle of Population came out in 1798. It turns out that the idea of evolution and of how evolution forms species uh, was discovered independently by, uh, but one of the discoverers was Darwin, who published in 1859. And we actually know from Darwin's autobiography that what, act, what inspired him was reading Malthus. So there's actually a direct intellectual connection where Darwin, reading Malthus, realized there must be this force that is shaping different species. And so it turns out that it's implicit within the Malthusian model is the idea of uh, evolution. And the reason this is going to happen, if we think about human societies where why is the amount of income, real income, that people command in different societies, that different families command? And what we see is if we look at the birth rate minus the death rate, that that is going to increase in income. Okay? And that there's going to be this equilibrium level of income. But if you look across any society, what we would expect in the pre-industrial world is that those who somehow command more income will produce a surplus of children. And those who command less income will have a deficit of children. And that while the society as a whole in the pre-industrial period the average woman produces very close to two surviving children, what you would actually expect if the Malthusian model is correct is that there'll be a group within any society which is producing more than two surviving children, and they'll be the ones who have garnered more access to resources in the society, and there'll similarly be a group that is producing less than two surviving children. Uh, and so that's an interesting possibility for the pre-industrial world. And it then, if it turns out that people inherit the characteristics of their parents, that will then imply that there's an inherent mechanism in this society which is changing the characteristics of the population. And it can only do so relatively slowly. But remember, the world was caught in this Malthusian trap for several hundred thousand years. And so there's a very long run period for that to operate on the characteristics of people within this world. And in particular, what's going to be interesting to look at is, well, what happened after the Neolithic Revolution? Because what we'll see is the Neolithic Revolution changed the character of human societies very dramatically. It changed the way that people got access to resources very significantly. And it operated for about 10,000 years before we get the Industrial Revolution. And so the interesting question is, are the people of the Industrial Revolution culturally and also even genetically 
identical to the people who experienced the Neolithic Revolution? Or was there sufficient time that we actually self-domesticated? <laughs> right? in, in the process after the Neolithic Revolution, animal and plant species were all dramatically changed by being adapted for human use. But we've tended to assume that people are essentially in the modern world the only original animals. That whereas dogs, uh, cows, uh, wheat, everything else we see around us is actually a product of human civilization, the assumption has tended to be that we ourselves were completely unchanged by this process. And so what the interesting question here is, was there a possibility that we self-domesticated? <laughs> that we actually adapted to modern, settled, agrarian society, and that we changed our characteristics. And most importantly, this would be culturally, but as I say, also genetically. And we'll see that there are actually ways in which people clearly genetically changed since the adoption of settled agriculture. One of these is uh, lactose tolerance. That varies across human societies, and it's quite predictable from the characteristics of the pre-industrial world. Uh, people's level now of uh, lactose uh, tolerance. We'll come back and, and talk about that. Now, what actually makes this uh, possibility interesting is that it's been speculated on by Jared Diamond in his very well-known book from 1997, Guns, Germs, and Steel. And Diamond, in the introduction to that book, uh, talks about his encounter with a, a man from New Guinea, in the hill tribes in New Guinea, who's asking, well, how come Westerners have all this income and we don't have any income, right? Uh, how did you end up with so much and we end up with so little? And Diamond says, well, one of the things that makes this question very puzzling is that in these societies in New Guinea, people live by their wits. They're violent societies. Uh, successful men have to be able to fight, they have to be able to make alliances, they have to be able to influence other people. And so survival in this world is really uh, one where for thousands of years uh, it's been a function of your abilities. But he said, if you look at settled agrarian society in China, in Japan, in Europe, survival there was going to be determined largely by your gut bacteria. Because one of the things we see as people gather in these large societies is that uh, disease becomes very important as a determinant of who survives and who doesn't with these much greater concentrations of population. And when I uh, first actually uh, saw this description in, in Diamond, I, I thought, well, it sounds like that will actually be correct. And that what you'll actually get in a society like England in the pre-industrial period is survival of the dumbest. Because what characteristic do we observe in a, in a society like England? We observe that rural populations have much better life expectancy and much better survival rates and higher net fertility then than urban populations. And in particular, cities like London were simply consuming people every generation. Right? A third of the population of London was disappearing every generation. It had to be constantly be replenished from the countryside. And where are the places in pre-industrial England that have the highest levels of education, the most number of people engaged in commerce? It's the big cities like London. And so it seemed that in the pre-industrial world, European civilization had been set up in such a way that it would consume the most adventurous, the most talented, the ones with the highest levels of education are simply being gobbled up in each generation by the terrible health conditions in the cities, and that the people who would ultimately be left in a society like England would be the ones who stayed in the rural areas longest. And that consequently, the least adventurous, the least uh, imaginative people would be the ones who ended up being the modern European population. And that Diamond would be right that New Guinea hill tribes <laughs> If anything, we're going to have this different characteristic that they consisted of a people who were much more adventurous, imaginative, much more likely to benefit from education than the remnants of the population that survived these thousands of years in societies like China or Europe or elsewhere.
And so that initially when I started uh, thinking about looking at this, it was with this idea that it would be an interesting result to find that uh, rural idiocy triumphed in Europe, uh, whereas uh, hunter-gatherer societies had this very different uh, uh, social dynamic or cultural dynamic. Now, to investigate this in England, I've already mentioned that one of the big sources, it turns out, we can use are the wills left by men in the pre-industrial world. And those wills start around about 1450 and continue all the way up till the present. And there's an astonishing number of those that actually survived in pre-industrial England. It's probably in, at least in the order of five million of these wills that survived through this period. The, the public record office up till 1859 has online about one and a half million men's wills. But that's just one of the courts in England that wills would end up in. There's also uh, all of these local courts where people with less assets would have wills. There's the, the York Diocese had its own record office. And so there's this huge collection of these wills. So potentially there's a huge amount of data here. And then the second thing about English social structure is that men in these wills seem to leave stuff to all of their children, at least in the years after about 1550. And the way we can check that is by looking at numbers of girls versus boys that are mentioned in the wills. Because if anyone is going to be omitted from the wills, it will tend to be girls. And the reason for that is that in the, the social structure in pre-industrial England, richer men would give their daughters a dowry at marriage. Right? When a marriage was arranged, the husband was bringing some potential assets to the marriage, and it was expected that the wife would bring something also. And so for people with property, uh, there was uh, this arrangement whereby the father would endow the daughter at the time of marriage. And consequently, it meant that by the time the will was made, it was often regarded that the daughters had already received their share. And so it was mainly the sons that you wanted to provide for in the wills or unmarried daughters. And so we would expect that if children are being omitted from these wills, what will happen is that there will be a sex imbalance. And you find that for wills in the 15th century and early 16th century, that too many boys are mentioned in the wills. But by the time you get to 1550, it's about equal, the number of boys and girls. And so it seems that people are mentioning uh, all of their children in these wills. And that consequently, we can get a nice measure of how successful people were economically, how much stuff did they leave, and also how many surviving children that they had at the time of their death. How successful were they reproductively? How successful were they in the Darwinian sense as well as in the economic sense? And going into this, the interesting question was going to be, what's that connection with income? And it seemed to be there was going to be this possibility that the connection would actually be negative even with income in England because of this effect of the cities and because richer people would tend to be concentrated in the cities. But it turns out that, actually to my surprise, there's a very powerful connection between wealth and reproductive success in pre-industrial England. And these wills are only made by people who had some property. Right? So it's not the bottom half of this society. In any typical settled society, something like a half of the population has no assets. That's true of modern America. There's a very large collection of people who own nothing and will almost never own anything throughout their lives. Right? And there's, so there's great wealth inequality. And so the people leaving these wills are pretty much in the upper half of the income distribution, but there's still a huge amount of variation. There's some people who are laborers who leave wills, and there's some people who are gentry. Now, the, the source I'm using doesn't have the very richest people. It doesn't have the earls, the dukes, the very wealthiest. And so basically, it's the middle classes and upper middle classes in the society. It's successful merchants and farmers, craftsmen, plumbers, carpenters. And so it's quite a wide range, but it's, as I say, it's in the middle of the income distribution. And what's the message from that for the pre-industrial period? Well, if we look at the poorest of these will makers, they're on average survived by about 1.9 children. That means they're actually dying out 
you need slightly more than two children to replenish yourself in a genetic sense in the population in the next period. You need slightly more than two because not all of these children, some of these children are still not of reproductive age, right? And not all of them are going to make it to reproductive age. So you need about 2.1 or 2.2 in order that you replace yourself genetically in the population. And so it turns out that even amongst the woe makers, the poorest of them are actually uh, leaving, not reproducing themselves. But if we look at the richest of these men, they left, on average, four and a half children. Okay? And what that means in the static pre-industrial world is that the upper 10% of the population in pre-industrial England was doubling its share of the population in each generation. That that upper group was doubling what share of the population actually came from it within each generation, and that essentially it's replacing the lowest group within the population. And that was going to happen every 35 years in pre-industrial England. The most successful 10% would double their share in the population when we move to the next generation. And so as this process operates over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, it seemed to be the case that somewhere like pre-industrial England was going to be taken over by the upper classes that eventually all of the poor of the medieval period would simply have disappeared <laughs> and that the, that the surviving English would actually be only the descendants of the upper class that in the medieval period or earlier, right? uh, that were all descended from relatively successful people at one period or another, it, it, those who are from England. Um, now, the... Why does it the case that the existence of towns and places like London don't eliminate this effect? And the reason is that even within the cities, it was still the case that the rich people left many more surviving children than the poor. So the cities mitigated this effect to some degree because they tended to have higher share of the very rich. But it's just as strong within the cities that the rich leave more surviving children than the poor. And since cities in the pre-industrial world, in pre-industrial England, are typically only, London's only about 10% of the population, even by uh, 1700, that effect just can't swamp this general effect that uh, what's happening is that the rich are actually taking over. And it's also the case in the pre-industrial period that there's quite a lot of rich people still out in the countryside because land is a very important asset in this society and a lot of the landowners are actually living out in the countryside and farming the land. And so that you really do get this powerful effect in pre-industrial England where the rich seem to be taking over. Okay? So that's the first characteristic. The second thing is, well, how far back does this effect operate? Okay? And it turns out that documents, documentary history in England only begins in, in big form around about 1200. <laughs> but we can actually show that this process operated for at least 550 years, all the way from 1250 to till 1800. How do we know that it operated in the medieval period as well? The reason we know that is from another medieval source which was something called the Inquisition post-mortem. And so what happened in, in the medieval period, property holding is legally more complex. And so there was a process called kind of sub-impudation, where the king would own property and he would parcel it out to various people. And he would still be the tenant, the owner-in-chief, and they would be technically a tenant of the king, even though effectively they, they owned the property. And he would have certain rights to this property. So, for example, if the tenants eventually left no heirs, the property would revert to the king. So he would want to keep track of who was occupying these properties so that he wouldn't lose out on his eventual uh, property claim. And so when the tenant of one of these properties died, there had to be an inquisition. And all the inquisition had to establish was, was there a male heir? And what age was the male heir? Was the male heir at age of majority? And so what we actually get, and these are people are going to be the upper classes of this society. So what we know from 1250 onwards was when rich men died in pre-industrial England, how often did they have a son? 
And we can actually infer from that what their net fertility was, right? Because there's a, a predictable connection between what your fertility level. So if you never, if you have no children, you'll have no sons. If you're on average only having two children, then typically you'll only have a son. Uh, what is it? Seventy-five percent? No, I have to. I can't do the calculation in my mind. But there, there's a predictable relationship between how many children you have and the probability that you'll have a son in each uh, generation. And uh, what we can then do is we can actually calculate what the number of expected surviving sons they had in the pre-industrial pre period. And so it turns out all the way back to the Middle Ages, richer men were leaving between one and a half and two sons each on average. And the average person in the population is only leaving one son. And so all the way back, they have a higher fertility than the average person in the population. And so that's why we know that this is a very long established process, and it seems possible that it had gone on for thousands of years in uh, pre-industrial Europe. Now, what type of people in pre-industrial England were the ones who were having this extraordinary reproductive success? It turns out that we can observe this process in some other societies, the variation of reproductive success, <laughs> but the way that you command resources and the way you get rich is actually by engaging in violence. And so there's a, a famous study of the Yano Mamo, which is a South American uh, kind of shifting agriculture tribe uh, that was studied famously by an anthropologist from Santa Barbara called Napoleon Chagnon, uh, who's a short and very uh, impetuous person. <laughs> and who is a subject of tremendous amount of controversy because he was actually accused. He studied this tribe and, and reported on their incredible fierceness and persistent warlike behavior. But a later study came out that argued that he had actually created most of the wars himself by arming the various factions. Uh, that's been proved to be completely false, right? Uh, but it is a, this is an interesting tribe because, as I say, the, the person who studied them is, is, is quite a colorful character, and he wrote these very interesting books, and they also made some films on the Yanomamo. And what intrigued Chagnon about the Yanomamo was why violence was so embedded in their culture, was why they engaged so much in violence just as part of the ordinary fabric of the society. And so one of the things that he undertook was a study of, well, what's the association between engaging in violence and reproductive success? within this society. And it turns out that he could do that relatively easily in Yanomamo society because they make a social distinction between men who have killed and men who have not killed. So just like we have a bachelor's degree and we distinguish college graduates and non-college graduates and you can easily figure out who's one and who's the other, in Yanomamo society everyone knows who are the killers and who are not the killers because if you kill then there's an obligation to go through a purification ceremony afterwards. And so people know those who have gone through this purification ceremony and those who have not gone through this ceremony. And violence is, to some degree, voluntary within this society because the, the typical way violence proceeds is that uh, violence is conducted for two reasons. One is revenge, and the other is to capture women. Those are the two big things that uh, pr promote violence within the society. And so these groups basically try and hide out from each other within the forest. They shift around. They have these secret encampments. But when they discover the location of another encampment, then they will often go on a raid. And so a whole group of men from the group will set out on the raid. It's voluntary if you want to participate. Uh, and along the way, though, Shanyon reports, something like half of the people who set out on these raids come back without actually participating in the raid. Right? Because you have to walk for days through the jungle, you twist your ankle. There's lots of excuses why you can say, "Oh, I'm out of it." Right? Uh, and so, and it's dangerous. You know, once the final raid occurs, because they typically they hit the other uh, encampment, and then they have to flee very rapidly because the survivors of the other group will come after them. And so, you know, you really you risk things by taking part in these raids. But with this prize of you get status by engaging in revenge, and they also capture women.
Uh, and so the women, that's how a lot of the brides in these society are, 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 are become brides, is that they're captured by this other group. By the way, I mean, it, it's, in his account, it's a shockingly violent society. Typically, if women are captured, they are raped by all the members of the raiding group before being brought back to the, the group and then allocated to someone as a wife, right? And so it's, as I say, this is a, these are not people that you uh, can imagine having, li settling into Davis very successfully. Um, <laughs> now, what then Chenyon did was, was to look at men who were killers and were aged 41 plus, right? So they'd made it through a significant chunk of adulthood. And then men who were non-killers, again at this age of 41 plus. And the first thing is, well, what are the numbers in these two groups? So it turns out that in his sample, there are 75 killers and only 46 non-killers. So the average man in that society, in his account, had killed at least once. And a number of them would be multiple times, right? So this is, a, as I say, it's a violent society. We'll, we'll see that in somewhere like pre-industrial England, you, you have very, very different social conditions than this. Uh, and then the question is, well, what are the numbers of offspring? Right? Now, unfortunately, these are not, the best measure would be surviving offspring and not, you know, but this is just the number of births that were attributable to each man, and uh, through often in, uh, through multiple wives. And the answer for the uh, killers was 6.99, and for the non-killers, 4.19. And so Chagnon wanted to argue then that why does violence persist in this society? Violence persists because it's a successful strategy reproductively. That men who kill are not punished for this in this society. In fact, they're rewarded. Right? And they produced more children. That the genes and the culture, more most importantly probably the culture of killers, are actually being transmitted through this process where they get access to women and they have higher status, they have more access to resources, and consequently they produce more offspring. Now, this is actually not a very good test of this idea. And the reason for this is that what these men are, are successful killers. Right? This is showing the outcomes. These are men who went on these raids, killed, and, and survived. It, to, it doesn't show what happened to people who engaged in this strategy of violence, but as a result of that, actually died. <laughs> and so it's quite possible if we had, you know, it's consistent with the idea that there's a reward for violence within this society. Okay? But it's not proof of the idea that there's a reward for violence because we don't see what everyone's strategy when they set started out. We don't see the, the outcomes for everyone at age 20 where some people said, I'm going with violence, and other people said, it's not for me. <laughs> okay? uh, and in fact, in terms of economists thinking of this in terms of game theory, would argue that since people choose which kind of strategy to pursue, that you would expect the, the net outcome to be the same. That going into this, people would say, well, you know, w which strategy works better? Well, if you do this way, you, you get rewarded with more children, but also uh, you have a higher chance of death, and so that a net in the equilibrium <laughs> Uh, participation in both strategies would be equivalent. Okay? But it is consistent with this idea that in hunter-gatherer societies there may be a reward for violence and that one of the things that is, you know, why is there, and I'll show you uh, in a little bit that violence is very common in hunter-gatherer societies and, and one of the ideas then is that the reason it remains common is that this is the way you get access to resources within this society. Now in terms of the, the uh, commonness of violence. Uh, let me just give you some data on that. So studies of modern hunter-gatherers and shifting cultivation societies establish what death rates per thousand per year are 
And so this is death rates for men that I'm going to look at within these societies. Uh, and so for the, the hunter-gatherer range in the modern world, ranges from 3.3 to 15, and this is per 1,000. Okay? So that in the Aceh, 15 out of every 1,000 men are murdered every year. Okay? And in the more peaceable groups that were observed, it's three out of every 1,000 men who are dying every year, out of every 1,000 males. Um, these rates of violence might not seem that high, but remember you're exposed to that rate of violence for every year that you live. And since life expectancy at birth is about 30, 33 within these societies, you have to multiply these rates by 30 to actually estimate what fraction out of 1,000 male births actually result in a death by violence. And what that implies for hunter-gatherer society is that 10 to 45 percent of men die violently within these societies. That the range is between 10 percent and 45 percent of men are actually dying violently. Right? And that's why I said this is a violent world. <laughs> now you get more sense of that. Because it's saying that in a lot of these societies, you can say, well, I've got one chance in three of being clubbed to death is the way I'm going to die. Right? Now, remember, I emphasize in the Malthusian world, that's not necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> right? In terms of living conditions, you've got to die of something. Would you rather die, you know, prolong, you know, three weeks of agony from some kind of fever or, you know, from some kind of horrible diarrhea? Or do you want to get a quick blow to the head? Right? It, it's not necessarily a bad world in which people end up dying uh, violently in this world. We're all going to die from something. Uh, the modern equivalent, by the way, of this is car crashes. Uh, we have surprisingly high rates of death uh, from uh, automobiles in our society. Um, and so undergatherers are up at this range. We can get some evidence from the Neolithic. Uh, this is very fragmentary evidence, but it turns out that when skeletons are left, sometimes it's possible for uh, archaeologists to actually infer the cause of death. So that if there's a spear embedded in the spine, <laughs> then you know that that's how the person died. Or if the head has been cleaved from the body. Uh, and you could also tell if it was a wound that healed or a wound that didn't heal, right? Because the, the bone will grow back if the person lives after the wound. So you can actually tell well, which wound actually came at the time of death because of this, this bone growth. By the way, for uh, some of, I think Denmark in the... Early in the late Stone Age, something like I can't remember the exact figure now, but it's something like three percent of all skulls had holes drilled in them. But they were drilled in them when the people were still living, and they seem to have been done for medicinal reasons. Uh, so I guess the the folk cure for headaches at that time was to uh, drill a hole in the skull, uh, and so it's amazing that people could survive. <laughs> this, uh, but there's actually a significant number of these uh, scones where people were actually drilling uh, uh, these holes as a kind of primitive, presumably primitive form of medicine. Uh, that was what you got on the healthcare plan in the Neolithic. Um, so in the Neolithic, it's actually possible for them then to do some calculation, and from that skeletal evidence, they claim that at least 1.4 men per thousand in each year were actually dying violent deaths. And that would imply a lifetime rate of about 5%. Okay? As I say, you have to multiply this number by 30 or 35 per thousand, and that will tell you what's the, the kind of lifetime rate. But this is very much going to be an underestimate because there's lots of ways of dying violently that might not leave any mark on the skeleton. Right? But the claim is that there's evidence both from modern hunter-gatherers and also from our own hunter-gatherer past, that these were societies which were relatively violent. Now, just to give some calibration of this, uh, I come from Scotland, which is a very peaceable, or in the United Kingdom is a very peaceable modern society. Uh, and so there, the rates of death from murder are about 0 0.01 per thousand per year for men. And that implies that and now we live 
70 or 80 years. So you have to multiply this number by this greater multiplicand to get the lifetime risk. But it still implies that your chances of dying violently in modern UK are about 0.1%. So it's one out of 10,000 people, males. Uh, one out of 10,000 males will actually die violently in that society. Uh, the interesting feature of the USA is that it's a relatively very violent modern society. And so the murder rates in the, U in the USA are about seven times what they are in modern England. Okay? And as I say, there's lots of debate about what causes this. Uh, the liberal position is that it's easy access to firearms. Uh, but it turns out that there are other societies like Canada which actually have relatively easy access to firearms where people don't shoot themselves at anything like the same rates that they do in the uh, uh, United States. In England now, or in the UK, I think it's under, only under extremely restricted circumstances is it possible to own a firearm. And a lot of these have to be kept under lock and key at gun clubs. Right? And so the English have had to resort to knifing each other uh, because of this. Uh, but uh, in the USSA, the, the, the rates are 0 0.07, and that implies about 0.6% of men will die violently over the course of their lifetime. Now, comparing these rates, there is one other important caveat here, which is this is a world where we have modern medicine. A lot of these people, the murder rate would be substantially higher if we didn't have modern uh, antibiotics and uh, casualty rooms, right? Uh, and so that actually we're much more violent relative to the past than we might think because we, we, you know, a lot of people are saved who would otherwise die. And in this pre-industrial world, any wounding that actually drew blood had a potential to kill people. And, for example, in the Civil War in the United States in the 1860s, it was quite common if someone was shot in the arm simply to amputate the arm. And the reason they did that was because the chances of the wound becoming infected, causing gangrene and then uh, killing the person were so high that it was simpler just to chop off the wound and cauterize the, 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 the amputation. Uh, and so uh, in the pre-industrial world, uh, any wound is potentially fatal, right? And so these rates of death, as I say, in the modern world would be much greater. We're much more violent than it might seem from, from these statistics. But on the other hand, we have much better instruments of violence, right? It's much easier just to pull a trigger and kill someone. Uh, if you actually have to bludgeon people to death, it takes a lot more energy and activity. Uh, and so it, it's a little, but, but it does show that there is this contrast between our world and the hunter-gatherer world. Now, what is it like in a settled society like pre-industrial England? Right? And the reason that that's interesting is that they had the same health conditions as in hunter-gatherer or earlier societies before 1800. Right? And, and the methods of violence are clubbing, knifing. Uh, guns are actually very rarely used, even in England before 1800. Uh, they're just not owned by very many people. Uh, it's, so it's very rare that, that early murders are by, by guns. And so it turns out that for England, all the way back to the Middle Ages, we can calculate the murder rates. The reason for that is that under English law, from the Middle Ages onwards, anyone who committed a felony and was found guilty of a felony, of which murder is one example, uh, their property went to the king. So the king had a strong financial interest in murders in that society. because And so every year, the king would have in each county uh, inquisitions set up to investigate all accidental and sudden deaths to see if murder was involved. Because as they, if it could be proved that someone had committed murder, that person could be convicted, then their property would actually revert to the king. Uh, by the way, that led to another peculiarity of law in pre-industrial England, which was that if I was charged with a felony, it was pretty clear I was guilty, then my family would lose all of my assets. But only if I was convicted of the felony. I couldn't be convicted until I pled. Right? So I had to come to court and they say, do you plead guilty or not guilty? If you simply stood silent, you couldn't, you could be sent back to prison until you agreed to plea 
but you couldn't actually be convicted of the felony. And so a strategy then of people trying to preserve the family property would be to refuse to plead. To get round that in English law, what they had to resort to in the Middle Ages, and this was still the case up until at least the 17th century, was the courts were permitted to torture people in order to force them to plead. And the way they actually did that was to lie the person down and start putting stones on them. So this was a standard legal procedure, was that if you refused to plead, they would take you to the prison and then just start placing stones on you. And at some point then, the, you know, the weight would get enough that people would finally plead or else they would kill them. And then that was perfect standard legal procedure that you were killed under this uh, legal process. <laughs> Uh, and so that you actually, even as I say in the 17th century, get this uh, process going on. It's just an established part of law. And so we actually know then for England, all the way back to the Middle Ages, so we know both what were kind of random killings within the society. We can also calculate for England how many English soldiers died in organized wars. Because we have records of all these battles, we know roughly how many people died in the various battles. And so you can actually do a kind of comprehensive inventory for pre-industrial England on, well, how violent was this society in the pre-industrial period? And so if we go to England, and we'll look at 1300, 1600, and 1800, and as I say, there are going to be two sources of violence within the society. There's the unorganized violence, which is where you murder your neighbors. <laughs> and then there's the organized violence, in which case uh, you get murdered by the French or the Scots uh, or the Welsh. Uh, and so uh, there's these two forms. Or else you get murdered by other people in civil wars within the society. And the interesting thing is that around about 1300, it's about 0.2 people per thousand die in ordinary violence. Okay? And as I say, that is much less than hunter-gatherer societies. Right? It's a much lower murder rate. As I say, when we add in the organized violence, that maybe amounted to about 0.3 men per thousand per year, 0.3 males per thousand per year. That gives us an overall rate of 0.5, and that implies that in medieval England, about 1.5% of men would die violently in that society. Okay? Uh, as I say, that's already an order of magnitude less than in hunter-gatherer society. And what it says is that 98.5% of men, <laughs> even in the Middle Ages in England, die in their beds. There's actually very few accidents in this society. So accidental deaths are very limited because... You know, what's going to kill you accidentally? They don't have a lot of machinery. They don't have automobiles smashing into each other all the time. And so the alternatives are basically violence, and then the other major one is just simply you die, die of disease in this society. Right? And so, as I say, there, there is this transformation that's taken place so that deaths are mainly by uh, disease. By 1600, that murder rate had dropped till now it's 0.05 men per thousand per year, right? Deaths by murder per thousand per year. As I say, that's lower than in the modern United States. So in pre-industrial England, ordinary violence is actually less common <laughs> than even in a... So if you think the U.S. is relatively safe, and this rate here, by the way, is still lower than a lot of modern societies. Modern Mexico has higher murder rates. Modern South Africa has higher murder rates. There's a lot of South American countries that have murder <coughs> rates that are in that kind of range. Right? And remember, people are exposed for a length, longer period of time, so the percentage of people dying violently in places like Mexico, a lot of South America now, are actually greater than in, in some of these uh, places like pre-industrial England. Okay? Um, and by then also, wartime violence had dropped, and so it gets us down to 0.25. So only 0.75% of all men die violently. By 1800, this rate is down to 0 0.02. Wartime violence is down to about 0.1 per thousand. The overall rate, then, is such that 0.4% of all men in English society by 1800 actually die deaths from violence, right? 
That's lower than in the modern United States as a rate of deaths from violence. And so one of the important things to emphasize here is that it's interesting that there's a very important transition between hunter-gatherer societies where violence is very common, where lots of men die violent deaths, and a settled agrarian society like England where violence actually becomes pretty limited within this society. And then there's another interesting puzzle here, which is why was England becoming much more peaceable over this period? The penalties for violence and the mechanisms of violence actually didn't change that much over these years. I already mentioned that English society actually had this bizarre feature, which was that a lot of people could murder and escape any punishment. The reason for that was that in the medieval period, only the, the uh, ecclesiastics had to be tried in ecclesiastic courts. They were not subject to secular courts. There were separate system of courts for clerics and for the rest of the society. When you were charged with a crime in the secular court, one way you could escape punishment was simply to establish that you were a cleric. And then you'd have to go to the ecclesiastical courts, and they had less severe punishments often than the secular courts. How did they establish that? Well, in medieval period, there's not good record keeping in this society. It wasn't that you could pull out your church ID card with your fingerprint on it and say, look, uh, I'm a signed up member right, uh, of the clerisy. And instead, then, they had to have some way of figuring out who's a cleric and who's not. The test that they used was the ability to read the Bible, because only clerics in that society could actually read. Right? And, and the thing is, the reason they had to have this test is that there are uh, clerics who actually uh, take a vow of uh, chastity and, and who are single, but in the medieval period, there are also people with clerical training who are actually married, and, and under church rules are entitled to be married, and who engage in you know, clerical work. That's why the name Clark or clerk actually comes from cleric, because they engaged in the bureaucracy of this society. Okay? And so the test that became established in English law was uh, there was something that came established called benefit of clergy, where if you were charged with any crime, you could simply say, I can read. And then you would, after being found guilty, you would be excused. Right? And that continued into the 17th century. And so I've seen the court records for Essex around about 1600. And what happens then is there'll be uh, someone who comes up accused of murder, or even a, uh, by then, uh, all felonies were subject to the death penalty. <laughs> and a felony would include things like stealing a sheep. Right? Uh, and a person would come up, and they would say, I plead benefit of clergy. They would hand them the Bible. And it's actually one specific passage became established in the law as the one you had to read. There's a particular page of the Bible. And the person would read and be excused. Or they would fail to read and be executed. <laughs> and so you have, as I say, a surprisingly lenient uh, judicial structure in this period, but consistent with these very uh, low rates of uh, violence uh, within the society in that period. Just as a last note before I let you go, it turns out in terms of occupations, what were the most criminal class in pre-industrial England around about 1600? Who were the people that were heavily associated with crime? The answer is it was butchers, right? And it's not because they had access to knives. It's because the major thing that you could steal in this pre-industrial world were animals. Right? If you think, what am I going to steal that I actually get, can haul away? Uh, houses you can't steal. There's not, there is money, but that tends to be pretty hard to get to. What else are you going to steal? The thing that's out in the fields are animals. But if you get an animal, <laughs> you need to sell it to someone. And so it was butchers who were the ones who were the receivers of all these stolen goods. So an astonishingly large fraction of criminals in pre-industrial England are actually butchers in this period. Okay. See you all on Friday. Remember a Scantron, pencil, and that's all you need.